In this module, I want to tackle head on the intriguing difference between how the bean counters in the accounting department of a firm measure profits and how economists do so. And of course, make the case that the economist's definition of profits is the more relevant one for making most business decisions. In a nutshell, a financial accountant will only count explicit costs. In contrast, an economist will count both explicit and implicit costs. This, what is the difference between explicit and implicit costs? Well, if you remember our lesson in which Pradesh and Maria were trying to decide whether Pradesh getting an MBA degree might be a good investment for their family, Maria's calculation certainly counted the explicit cost of the school tuition and fees. But Maria also included the implicit so-called opportunity cost of the wages that Pradesh would have to forego by going back to school. More broadly, in a business context, explicit costs are the firm's monetary payments to outsiders for things like labor, materials, fuel, transportation, and power. In contrast, implicit opportunity costs represent the money payments the firm could have earned by employing its resources in their best alternative use. In fact, the implicit opportunity costs of business decisions are often far more important in the strategic decision-making process than the explicit costs. Let me illustrate this point with this example. Suppose both you and your spouse earn after-tax salaries of $45,000 a year as sales representatives for a hospital equipment distributor, but you have much higher aspirations and no shortage of entrepreneurial ambitions. So what do you do? Well, you both quit your jobs to open up your own business and one that leverages your expertise in health foods. In fact, your new business is a health food juice bar called Juice Me Up Scout. For your startup capital, you borrow $20,000 from the bank at 10% interest. You kick in another $30,000 of your own savings that had been earning you $1,500 annually in interest income from your portfolio bond investments. And you also kick out the tenant in the storefront that you own so you can use it for your own business. A tenant, by the way, who is paying you $800 in rent per month. Now take a look at this income statement that your accountant has prepared for your business after a year of operation. Items two, three, and four represent your cost of goods sold, which are basically your variable costs. These total $97,000 and include employee compensation, operating costs such as utilities and materials, like the 400 pounds of carrots and 1,000 bushels of oranges that you've juiced. Items six, seven, and eight represent your fixed costs because in the short run, as we know, these costs can't be changed. You can see that these fixed costs total another $18,000 and they include things like selling and administrative costs as well as rent, which in your case is zero because you own the building. And also note this curious item. As part of the fixed costs of running your business, there is also a category called depreciation. Here's how to think about this category of expense. When your company buys, say, a cash register for your store, it may have an estimated useful life of 10 years. So each year you are in operation, you are in effect using up a portion of that machine's useful life. Depreciation is, therefore, simply a way of measuring and accounting for the annual cost of each capital input that your company owns. That's depreciation. Now, subtracting net sales from operating expenses, you come up with a net operating income of $140,000. Not too shabby. 
But of course, from this net operating income, you will also have to subtract the taxes you pay to the government, as well as the interest payments on your loan. So what's your bottom line? Well, you wind up with an accounting profit or net income before taxes of $135,000, but an after-tax accounting profit of $90,450. And that looks pretty good for a year's work, doesn't it? And it is at least a few dollars more than the $90,000 you and your spouse earned in your old jobs. So on the whole, and given that you are now your own bosses, maybe this is all worth it, right? But wait, what implicit costs have you ignored in this calculation? Think about that for a few minutes and try redoing the analysis as an economist rather than as an accountant. And tell me what your bottom line really is. Take a minute to pause the presentation now to do so and this exercise is well worth doing. Okay, here's my calculation. It shows that at least in this case, you and your spouse actually wound up being worse off by going into business for yourselves. Consider that by providing your own financial capital, you gave up $1,500 in foregone interest. In addition, by kicking out your tenant, you also gave up $9,600 in annual rent. And then, of course, there's the aforementioned $90,000 in after-tax salaries that you and your spouse gave up to work for yourselves. Subtracting all of these implicit costs from the accounting profit, you actually wind up for all your blood, sweat, and carrot juice with a negative economic profit, that's not very good. In fact, people make mistakes like this all the time in both their personal and professional lives because they base important decisions on accounting rather than economic profits. So please be careful and always consider your implicit costs and opportunity costs when you make a decision. And of course, with this example, I, I certainly don't want to discourage you from being entrepreneurial, right? the opposite. Instead, I just want to help you choose the right enterprise when it comes time to maybe set up your own. With that said, it's on to an overview of the important field and business of operations and supply chain management in the next module. So have at it when you're ready.